Hey everyone, Knox County Mayor Glenn Jacobs here. We're doing a couple of videos about Black History Month, talking with influential folks in our community and getting their perspective on what Black History Month means to them. Today I'm joined by the incomparable Halloran Hilton Hill. Halloran, thanks for joining us and welcome. What an honor to be here, Mayor. I'm gonna put you on the spot. Sure. Do you remember the first time we ever met? Um, I know you've been on my show a bunch of times and I always enjoyed it. So the very first time I was promoting a WWE event here in Knoxville and I was over at, um, I don't think you were at Cumulus at that point, but what, the, the radio station. Right. And I was, I was on someone else's show and they're like, Howard wants to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I go down and I never met you before or anything. And I sit down and you're like, you know, you, when we literally start on air and you're like, this is the real Triple H. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it was great. And this is, gosh, man, it's probably been, that's probably almost been 20 years ago at this point. It has to be because I remember we didn't talk about wrestling. We, we got into, business. we talked about business. Yeah. I think of that one we really talked about like the wrestling business and the all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. sir. Man, tell us about your life, please. Man, it's been a, it's been fantastic. You know, I had a guy ask me the other day, he said, what do you think uh, the secret of your success has been? And if I've had any reasonable success, I told him it was grace. Like it's the grace of God, because I think I've had a career in spite of, and you know, in this month, when we think about history, my grandfather, I'm a, I'm a son of this state. So my grandfather was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he was born in, I think he was born in 1870 something. Um, they found him under a house in Chattanooga um, right after reconstruction, right after the emancipation. What do you mean they found him? Yeah, so th this, is, okay. this is where the story gets right. good. Um, so what happened was a lot of, this happened all over the South, but you had former slaves that had nowhere to go. I mean, you're free to do what? You're not gonna start a business. So you had these kids that were in the street, parents that had nothing to do, nowhere to go. And what I'm told is that his father and his brother died and his mother disappeared. And so he crawled under a house in Chattanooga he was discovered by some people and taken to what was then a basically illegal orphanage. A woman from Massachusetts by the name of Almira Steele had moved from Massachusetts. She found her mission field in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and she started an orphanage. And at that time, the state would not allow you to take in children of color or handicapped or disabled children of any color. And she was taking in black children and handicapped white children and putting them in the same place. Sure. And so that's where my father was found and raised in, an, in the steel home for children in Chattanooga. Wow. So he had seven children. My father was the oldest and my father went to college. And But when I think about history and my story, that's my story. Um, Tennessee is the state where we go from nothing to something. So I think about the life and the opportunity that I've had. I came to Knoxville 32 years ago. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have anything. I rode the bus looking for work. Uh, I found work. I found opportunity. And now radio, television, leadership development. But I owe it to the hope, the forward momentum that my grandfather was able to create in the worst of times. The only thing he had to leverage was his faith. That's it. There was no money, there was no, but he believed, if I can make it one more day, and he squeezed enough days out of his life to get to my father, who squeezed enough days out of his life to get to me. You talked about your grandfather's journey and your father's journey. Who else has inspired you? Well, here locally, there were a lot of people that Alex Haley was the one who used to say, if you see a turtle on a fence post, he had help, right? And so there've been a lot of people here locally. Um, I just saw Mike Hammond, uh, Mike Hammond. I worked for Mike Hammond for years and he gave me some wonderful opportunities and Bobby Denton and James Dick, um, big Jim Haslam, Jim Clayton, all of those people were, you know, they really helped me a lot 
broaden some of my perspectives and opportunities. Um, Howard Baker was a, a great friend of mine. They helped me see things uh, differently. But I've been inspired by people who find a way to, to have an impact who don't have political influence. So I, I remember just Helen and Ellen at the Love Kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, people like that. Right. Um, I've, I've actually been impacted by people like yourself. When, when you came to this community and the way you invested, and then the, I've just watched the way you've uh, run the government with a very steady hand, both fiscally, but then also trying to encourage this community to grow, not to get stuck. It's been pretty good. Uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with you. It's, it, for me, it's all about economic opportunity. And when people have hope, that, that the opportunity will, you know, those opportunities will be there if you keep on trying, you know, or you can do anything with your life. It's just a matter of, yeah, getting the right breaks, but it's just also a matter of using your talents and working hard um, to make those breaks for yourself. And I mean, I believe that with every core of my, you know, with every fiber in my being. I think, I think in the African-American community, that's the future is to figure out a way to create more sustainable economic opportunity. And that means business growth and development. That means the quality of education meeting the educational or the employment opportunities that are in the region. Things are moving in that direction. I'm, I'm really happy about uh, some of the things that schools are doing and, and other organizations surrounding education. And I think over the next several years, we're really gonna see the needle move on some of those things. And I think that's just wonderful. I look at the word race and then if you put a G on the front of it, <laughs> grace. And if God gets in the middle of that, and when, I, when we started the interview, that's it. For me, if that ain't happening, nothing ain't happening. <laughs> what does Black History Month mean for you personally? It means possibility. When, when I look at the experience of African Americans in the United States of America, I think everybody should look at the history and story of Africans in America as possibility up against incredible odds. Not only have African Americans found a way to survive, but they found a way to contribute in profound ways, right? Music, art, culture, science. It's almost like when you, when you step on us, wine comes out, right? And I, I think that's what gets lost. When people start to talk about diversity and they start to talk about inclusion, they see it as an add-on when in fact, it's the way God made us. You're my brother, we, we were made by one God. The question I ask people all the time is, so which one did he mess up on? Because not to love me is to indict God. Our communities will get better when we embrace that simple idea. There's bad everywhere. There's good everywhere. Our job is to look for the good and connect it and to assume that it exists everywhere. And I think that's, that's the struggle. So this, when I, when I look at, you know, Black History Month or African American history, I look at American history and it's a story of possibility because if I just look at my own grandfather, he literally couldn't be sitting here doing what I'm doing, right? But I'm here because he believed me here. And what's possible for us in the future, if we can, if we can ever, I don't want us to get beyond race, I want us to embrace it. If we can ever get to the point where you know, I talk about racial equality is probably a, a, a government thing, but racial maturity is a spiritual thing. And I, I think what gets us to that, uh, racial maturity is, is gracial maturity. Grace is what, is what changes the heart and changes the soul and puts us in a position where we can see the humanity in each other. And once I have that fundamental respect for you and you have a fundamental respect for me, and then we figure out, hey, you're good at this, I'm good at this. This plus this is more than two. 
it's it's a the the the, the plus sign turns over and becomes a multiplication sign, right? It's a force multiplier. It's not just additive. Um, that's what it means to me is possibility. And that's what, that's what I want people to see is possibility, to see humanity, humanity and then possibility. You've had some setbacks in your own life. You were uh, a guest preacher at Faith Promise Church, and I was there that day. Uh, it was an amazing sermon that you gave. Uh, it, it was really just really about life and as you say inspiration and hope and keeping going uh i never knew for instance that you were in the caribbean and doing pretty well and then your life just got completely turned upside down get there hurricane hugo is running a radio station hurricane hugo takes out the radio station and we lose everything and i spent a couple of years helping them get that back together and then basically washed ashore here in knoxville but once again, this, this thing we call hope, if you can just hang on, and I, and I think it's one of the things I love about Knoxville, Knox County, the state of Tennessee, um, this is a place, it's not perfect, but this is a place where if you have hope, you probably can find opportunity. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, what brought you to Knoxville? I think your sister, your sister, sister lived in here? My sister, sister lived, lived here. here. My sister yeah. took us in. We were living in one room at her house. Yeah. And uh, my sister, who's also my best friend, uh, she took us in. And th there's something that happens when, when you go through difficult things in your life, it is a great process of discovery. First of all, you discover who you are and what you're made of. You discover who really loves you, right? And you get to experience a higher, deeper quality of love because the people who really care about you, when they care about you here, you're gonna be all right here. And to be embraced by my sister and her husband and not to be looked at as defective because I was going through a hard patch. That was an important part of my journey was people believing. I think, uh, you know, you as mayor, that's one of the things that you, you give to our community is I think one of your chief jobs is to put forward the fact that it can happen. And I know you've spent a lot of time telling people, hey, if you try, you can make something happen. That's not a small thing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think hope is really one of the most important things that we have, might be the most important thing. And as you say, ain't guaranteed you're gonna make it, but what is guaranteed is you ain't gonna make it if you lose hope and you quit trying, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So folks here in our area will know you as a talk show host. Right. Uh, also from your TV program, Anything is Possible. You're also an author. Uh, you're also a Grammy winning songwriter nominated. as well. Nominated. nominated. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, we just, that's fine. I've never, I've never been nominated for a Grammy in my life. Man, I mean, you're just into all these different things. Uh, what inspires you really? And, and, and we've talked too. I'm an introvert. People don't believe that because I keep on picking these careers where I have to be very extra. And you're the same way though. You're an introvert as well. What inspires you to step out of your comfort zone and do these things that uh, again, you just hollering as hollering probably isn't really comfortable doing them because you have to go out and show yourself to the world. You know, I was, I was talking to somebody in our radio company and they were asking me about my story, right? I think purpose is what pushes you outside of the box. So my mother was a fantastic person. And if you ever met her, you probably would have no idea that she struggled with clinical depression. And I grew up Seventh-day Adventist. We kept the, we rigorously kept the Jewish uh, Sabbath or Shabbat, sundown Friday, sundown Saturday. There was nothing. So, but on Friday night, we could, listen to a Christian radio station in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That radio station took request. I was always fascinated with radio, these voices, and I was a loner and I was an introvert. So I'd be in my room and I'd listen to the radio late at night and I would listen to talk shows. These big commanding voices, they seemed sure, the world seemed bigger. My mother would let me call the radio station and make request. Before I would make a request on Friday night, I'd go through the house and turn on all the radios, <laughs> right? And I was not making a request. I was co-hosting this guy's show for 90 seconds, right? 
when I would, when my voice would boom through the house on the radio, the cloud would lift off my mother for a while and she would get happy and she'd get animated and she'd call her friends, did you hear him? And it would be a moment of joy subconsciously as a little boy, and I'm probably seven years old, six years old when this happened, when this is happening, I made this connection that these platforms of public communication could be used to cast a light or bring light to people. That's my why. So when I'm writing music or when I'm doing my television show or I'm doing my radio show, even though we get caught in this mix of politics, at my core, that's what's happening. This notion that maybe we could add value to somebody's life. I think the same is true for you. You see these big ideas, you see opportunity, you see that if we can get people to work together, we can, we can have a great community and make things happen. And when you see that, and then you've been given certain abilities or passions, or you've developed skill sets to employ those for the benefit of someone else, forces you out of your comfort zone. And, and it really gets back to what you believe. And I don't know that I would be, you know, public facing were it not for just something inside of me that wants to throw light into the world, sincerely. So music is the same thing. I'd write this music, I would see people respond to it. It would bring them joy or help them figure something out. And so to this very day, like to this, to this day, I'm still writing music and putting stuff together. One of the projects that you're working on that I find most interesting is your search for wisdom. Can you tell us about that, please? I spent all this time studying the life of King Solomon, ended up writing a book about it, wrote a paraphrase of the book of Proverbs, which led me into leadership development work. And I started a company called Hapagee. And our tagline is joy infused, purpose driven peak performance. My definition of wisdom is that wisdom is highly developed skill and insight applied at the right time to produce the right result for all the right reasons. So you develop a skill, you develop this insight, this deep intuitive understanding of people and situations, and then you have the courage to apply it at the right time to produce the right result coming from the right space. First of all, I started studying wisdom, not because I knew it, because, but because I needed it, right? <laughs> because I, I, I can be a very foolish person. And, we're, we're all <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's led me into this work. Uh, we created a, a 10 module curriculum and we've got 17 executives going through it now. And uh, it's been pretty fascinating to help people build the skill sets to perform well, but also to connect what they're doing to their higher purpose, to infuse it with joy. Because when people have joy in what they're doing, and it's connected to purpose, they'll hit the numbers, right? You're gonna, you're gonna, in fact, you're gonna exceed the numbers. But if you're just numbers driven, you get burned out. So I, I wanted wisdom, I need it, and I wanna be part of helping people find that wisdom essentially so they can add value. I really believe that in our community and in our county, strategically, especially along racial lines, cultural lines, whatever, that our, our strategy going forward ought to be 360 degrees of hope, right? No matter which way you look in our county, you should see hope and economic opportunity, right? And we're one community. And I would want people to believe that that's possible. That's where it starts, right? More than anything else is if we could just believe that that's possible and work toward that, it might be great. Um, you're still doing that search for wisdom thing, right? Because I think you kind of got it. <laughs> well, my friend, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, you're an inspiration to me as well. So just keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you.